morning and welcome to Phoenix Seventh-day Baptist Church. Doug and Jane, did you ever think this would happen? This is a wonderful experience. And Doug and Jane are here from uh, Colorado this morning. They played an incredibly important part in the beginning of our ministry to the Seventh-day Baptist Church. And I just want to say thank you for what you guys have all done. Uh, not only you, but those who in the, in the conference who have helped us along the way. It's good to have you guys here today. And I just want you to know we love you and appreciate what you're doing for God's cause. I think the only announcement that I need to make is one that is listed in the bulletin. And that is that a week from this coming Wednesday, that the week from this coming Wednesday, yes, that would be correct. On November 15, we will be having a special meeting here at the church, five o'clock, and Jeremiah Owen and Jim Shore will be here from the Foothill Community Church in California, Montrose, and they will be here to share with us the beginnings of our relationship with them. Again, have a ceremony of signing a, an agreement that makes them our sponsorship church and um, gets us connected with them as we make our way toward uh, official full status as a conference church. So please, uh, please be here for that meeting. We are going to have dinner for everyone, and perhaps uh, the ladies will want to recruit you to bring something. I don't, I don't know, but it will probably be a Pollock, I'm guessing. And um, and we will have dinner about five o'clock ish, and then we will have our meeting with Pastor Shore and Jeremiah. So please uh, make that a, an important part of your calendar for a week from this coming Wednesday. Let's pray together as we begin. Father in heaven, on this Sabbath morning that you've given us a beautiful day. The, the beginning of the most wonderful weather in the United States. We come to you to, to share with, with one another the word of God and worship together. And we pray that your presence will be felt among us as we, as we do those things. I pray, Lord, that your spirit will move through me as I share the word of God. And I ask, Lord, that that our hearts may be inspired to be um, more dedicated followers of Jesus Christ as we look toward your coming. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Sing for the rest of my life. Jesus is the light, the light of the world. Come, let us celebrate Him. Lift up your voices and sing. Jesus is the light, the light of the world. Sing for the rest of my life. Jesus, Jesus is the 
weeks ago, we studied Matthew 24, verses 7 and 8. Verses 5 and 6, 7 and 8. Matthew 24 is the template of Bible prophecy. It is the words of Jesus to his disciples and to us that gives us a skeletal view of time on earth from the time that Jesus gave this prophecy on the Tuesday before his death until the coming of Jesus. And so we learned that in verses 4 and 5, I'd like to actually go to Matthew 24 again as we introduce our subject for today. We uh, find in verses 6 and 7 that he said that the signs of the end would come in this manner, that there would be wars and rumors of wars, verse 6. And uh, he says, See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. But then in verse 7, he says, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And as we learned that are in our last study, there are sections, segments of this prophecy that lead us from the time of Jesus' prophecy all the way till his coming. And all through the ages, there have been wars. And we enumerated some of them last time, some of the wars that we have seen. But he says, but the end is not yet. But then as he introduces the next piece of this picture in verses 7 and 8, he says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famine, pestilence, sword, and earthquake. These are the beginning of sorrows. So now we're in a different time period as Jesus leads us on through the sequence of events that lead up to his second coming, which is spoken of clearly and, and dramatically in the last part of the chapter. So, today we're going to look at a, we're going to zoom in. We're going to zoom in on the prophecy of verses 7 and 8 from the perspective of John the Revelator. But before I do, I want to show you that these three judgments of God, sword, famine, and pestilence, are a series of judgments that have come upon the earth and upon the people of God in the Old Testament time and time again. In Jeremiah chapter 29, he says, Behold, I will send on them, those who had resisted, sword, famine, and pestilence, and will make them like rotten figs that cannot be eaten. They are so bad. And I will pursue them with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence. And I will deliver them to trouble among the kingdoms of the earth. Then in chapter 34, we have the, the verse that was read this morning. And it's interesting that we read in Jeremiah 34 and beginning with verse 13. Thus says the Lord of God of Israel, I made a covenant with you and your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt and of the house of bondage. This is the backdrop for the judgments that God sent upon Israel. He says, therefore, in verse 17, our scripture for today, written on the back of your bulletin. Therefore, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming liberty, every one to his brother and every one to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim liberty to you, says the Lord. What kind of liberty? Liberty to the sword, to pestilence, and to famine. And I will deliver you to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth. I, I did a, a study of these, these three words, sword, famine, and pestilence in the Old Testament, in the Bible. I came up, I haven't counted them, but you can see on two pages the number of texts of Scripture that talk about the sword, famine, and pestilence as judgments of God upon his people because of their refusal to subject themselves to his rule. This is the way God sends judgment upon people in the earth. 
So why do I make a point of this? Because obviously, Israel is in a different situation today. This is we're now in a Christian era, and we're looking at sword, famine, and pestilence. What did Jesus say in Matthew twenty-four? There will be nation rising against nation, the sword. Kingdom against kingdom, sword. And there will be famine and pestilence and earthquake. And this is the beginning of sorrows. Last week we talked about The Perfect Storm. I don't know if, how many of you have seen the movie or read the book, The Perfect Storm. It's an incredible story that comes out of Gloucester, Massachusetts, of a fishing boat went out and went out to sea and they didn't catch a lot of fish so they kept going way on beyond the boundaries and as they got way beyond the boundaries they caught a lot of fish but their ice machine broke down so they had to start coming back but by that time there were storms brewing between them and Gloucester their port their home port and so they forged their way they decided they were going to keep plugging along and they went through terrible storms as one storm came and another storm came up from this direction and the hurricane came in between. There was a convergence of storms that came together and swallowed up the ship before they could get home. Perfect storm. We talked about the things that are happening in our world today. A nation in decline. We live in a nation in decline. We live we're with moral depravity. We live in political corruption. We live in circumstances where there are storms that are converging together in our nation, in our country, and in our world. To say nothing about the, the unrest in the Middle East right now, which is scary, to be frank. It's scary. The potential of that conflict and how it could go and take our world further into bloodshed. What did Jesus say? I would bring sword, famine, and pestilence on the earth before the great day of the Lord. Yes, that's what he said in Matthew 24. So today we want to see that this, I want you to observe a Bible principle. And uh, I'm going to ask Priscilla if she would pass out the handouts that I have for you today. And as she's doing so, I want to tell you a story. In AD 79, on the west coast of Italy, there was a mountain called Mount Vesuvius. It is the only active volcano on the mainland of Europe. And in AD 79, what happened in AD 70? Remember what happened in AD 70? Destruction of Jerusalem. So in AD 79, Mount Vesuvius destroyed the city of Pompeii, a city south of Rome, and it destroyed it in about 25 hours completely. Pompeii was established in 600 BC and was slowly recovering from a major earthquake that had rocked the city in February of AD 62. The shallow quake originating beneath Mount Vesuvius had caused major damage to the springs and piping that provided the city's water. Reconstruction was being carried out on several temples and public buildings. Seneca, a historian, recorded that the quakes lasted for several days and also heavily damaged the town of Herculaneum and did minor damage to the city of Naples before subsiding. Major earthquakes. A major earthquake was followed by several minor shakes throughout the following years. Have you ever lived in earthquake country? Anybody here? I woke up one morning in California with my bed rolling around on the floor. It was on a wood floor and the bed was just on rollers and it was just rolling around. It was shaking. We've lived in, some of us have lived in earthquake country. And it says, that because the activity, the seismic activity was so common in the area, citizens paid little attention. They were used to it. In August of 79, when several quakes shook the earth between Herculaneum and Pompeii, people were unprepared for the explosion that took place shortly after noon on the 24th of August. 
Around 2,000 residents survived the first blast. But ash blocked the sun by 1 p.m., and the people tried to clear heavy ash from their rooftops as it fell at the rate of about six inches an hour. Shortly after midnight, a wall of volcanic mud engulfed the town of Herculaneum, obliterating, obliterating the town as its citizens fled toward Pompeii. About six hours later, on the following morning, a glowing cloud of volcanic gases and debris rolled down the slopes of Vesuvius and enveloped the city of Pompeii. Most victims died instantly as the superheated air burned their lungs and contracted their muscles, leaving the bodies in a semi-curled position to be quickly buried in ash and thus preserved in detail for hundreds of years. It is believed that around 30,000 people died from the eruption of Vesuvius that day. If you've been to La Brea Pits, Tar Pits, I think that's where I saw a display of one of the bodies or maybe more than one of the bodies of the people that had been burned and died, swallowed up by that volcanic ash back in 79 AD. There are pictures of bodies in kind of a curled position as they're trying to get their breath and the, and the volcanic mud just comes right over them and they become a form cemented as it were in in their position in their in their bodily form you can see pictures of these on the internet of these bodies that were that died in the eruption of vesuvius i think one of the points that i want to make out of the story is that they had no idea it was coming and yet there were signs all around them that something could happen Something could happen. There were earthquakes. There were constant tremors, and they got used to it. It was part of their life, much as it is in some of the parts of California today, because it was that's their home. That was their home. That was their life. And they failed to see the signs, and they lost their lives. So, in the handout that I gave you, there is a parallel between prophecy that Jesus gave us in Matthew 24 to a passage that I would like to point your attention to in Revelation chapter 6. The thing is this. There are not a lot of people who enjoy the study of prophecy as I do. I know that. Sometimes, and I think uh, Arda said it very well last week, two weeks ago, she said, I think a lot of people just don't understand Revelation, and so they don't have an interest in it because it's too complicated, but it's not. And one of the principles of understanding the book of Revelation is seeing how the, the images of John in his, in his writings can be found elsewhere in Scripture, can be found elsewhere. There are shadows in the Old Testament. There are shadows that point to the things that John tells us will take place before Jesus comes. And of course, Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 24 is one of those prophecies that help us understand what John was talking about when he wrote Revelation 6, which we will look at in a moment. But in the Old Testament, we find all of those references, all of those references to the sword, famine, and pestilence, the three judgments of God that he used, had used consistently throughout the Old Testament in response to the, the, uh, the waywardness of Israel and their unwillingness to bend to his rule, ruling. So we are in a position today where we are in a perfect storm in our world. This is not just an ordinary war that's going on in the Middle East. And this is the, the, the backdrop for that war in the Middle East is not just an ordinary picture of hu human life here in our nation today. There is a convergence of storms that are coming together. And I would be remiss if I did not point out what we see in Scripture as 
the as the foretelling of what the Bible tells us will be coming. So let's look at Revelation chapter 6, and you can compare what we read in Revelation chapter 6 with what is on this sheet. Matthew 24 compared to Revelation chapter 26. Let's look at this. It says in verse 1, these are the seals, the seven seals. These are the seven seals of Revelation. Revelation 6, 1. Now I saw when the Lamb, who's the Lamb? Jesus. In the previous chapter, he is the one that was found worthy to open the seals. No one else was worthy, only him. And when I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice, like thunder. Let's get the, uh, let's get the, the, um, the import of what's happening here. Come and see. One of the four, four living creatures cries out with a voice like thunder, come and see. And John says, and I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. This is the backdrop for what happens at the end of time. There is something happening as Christ himself, as Jesus himself, rides in the rides forth on a white horse in the person of his people. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about some of these prophecies, but I want you to be clear that this is a picture of Jesus riding forth through the earth in the person of his people, conquering and to conquer. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, and we'll go back to it, and it's referenced in your sheet there. Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. This is a picture of Jesus in the person of his people going forth before Jesus comes, going forth with the gospel message, with the message of salvation to a dying world, to a doomed world, as the, the events that proceed from this point take place. Jesus, in the person of his people, on a white horse. Uh, maybe I should make this comment too. One of the principles of interpretation of Revelation, because I want you not only to hear my message today, but I want you to be able to go back and look at the book of Revelation differently than you did before. One of the principles that we talked about two weeks ago, is that a lot of the images of Revelation, a lot of the characters of Revelation are so obscure, they are masked. They wear masks. They are, they are symbolic. They are represented in symbol. For instance, a rider on a white horse, you know, going forth, conquering. The rider on the white horse, who is the rider on the white horse? How would you know who the rider on the white horse is unless you looked at other references in the Bible as you compare Scripture with Scripture and see that there are, there are words and characters and symbols that are used that are not, they are like, you, you, don't, you don't see them as they are. They are not face value in front of you. You don't see what they are. The characters are symbolic. The characters are masked. It's a principle. But the activities of those characters are literal. There's nothing hidden in their activity. And so we have this horse, white horse, representing righteousness. A lot of people want to say that's the Antichrist. It is not the Antichrist. This is a picture of the gospel going to the whole world, Matthew 24, 14. Again, this is a parallel prophecy that we see here. Jesus riding the white horse. The white horse is a symbol, and white is a symbol. A symbol, it represents the righteousness and the purity of the rider and his activity, and so he's going forth conquering and to conquer. And this is, this is the backdrop for the horses that follow and the judgments that follow. And what are the judgments that follow? Well, let's look. Verse 3, 
When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him what? A great sword. Where have we seen that before? And I will bring judgments upon my people, Israel, because they have ignored me. They have not obeyed me. They have disregarded my commands. I will send the sword and famine and pestilence upon them as a judgment. Well, we're seeing this playing out right here in the book of Revelation again. So let's look, let's look at the next horse. First the sword. Then he, by the way, the sword, I want, I want to, I want to uh, emphasize one of the phrases that is in this verse that helps us to understand why this is important to us even today. He is granted to take peace from the earth. Has peace been taken from our earth? Yes, it has. And from our nation in particular, yes, it has. In fact, I believe that 9-11 was basically a foretaste of what is ahead. And now we see the Middle East in an upheaval as peace is being taken from that region and could very well affect us as a nation, us in our homeland. We know that. from. Have you been watching the news? Do you watch the news? Do you see what's going on? Yeah. So. He is granted that he that to take peace from the earth. And what is the color of this horse? Red. Why do you think that's important? This is one of the one more detail that helps us to understand that there is bloodshed. What did Jesus say? A nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, he said. That's the sword. And that is bloodshed. That is war. That is taking peace from the earth. And so John, in this prophecy of the, the four horses of the apocalypse, the second horse is red, and he is granted to take peace from the earth. Verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. I can't help but believe that God says that to us through these verses today. He wants us to see. He wants us to understand. He told us these things so that we would know. He said, watch and be ready. But if, if we're watching, what are we looking for? I want you to know what you're looking for today from the book of Revelation, from the prophecy of Jesus of Matthew 24. Come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice. This, this is one of those verses that you look at and say, what could that possibly mean? I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not harm the oil or the wine. What's that all about? It's the weight of the, the necessities of humanity being weighed because there is so little of it. It, is, it represents scarcity. How do I know that? Well, not only is that kind of obscurely there, but in the next, in the next seal, and we'll keep reading. So this is the famine. This is the famine. In the next one, he opened the fourth seal, verse, verse 7. I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of whose, him who sat on it was death, and the grave followed with him. And power was given to them. What? Who are they? Those three horses, the red, the black, and the pale horse. Power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with what? sword, with hunger, and with death. And when Luke talks 
about what Jesus said in Matthew 24 in his gospel in Luke 21, he also adds pestilence, pestilence, and by the beasts of the earth. So what's my point? My point is this. My point is this. These are the judgments that we can expect on the earth in the coming days as we approach the return of Jesus Christ. I'm not a prophet. I'm not predicting anything. I'm only pointing out to you what the Bible says and applying it to our, to our life today in this earth. These things are about to come upon the earth. They are. And they will come upon the earth before Jesus comes. Do you believe Jesus is coming soon? I believe Jesus is coming soon. Tomorrow? No. Two years from now? No. Soon? Yes. Yes, I do. He's coming soon. And there is actually a time prophecy, which we'll study another time, but not today, that shows us that there is a period of tribulation. And that's what Jesus talks about again in Matthew 24, as he goes from the gospel going to all the world, white horse represented in, in Revelation. As the gospel goes to all the world, it says, then the end will come. And then he goes on to talk about the great tribulation, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. It is a repeat of the first century, only in much greater drama to a much greater extent. Prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 24 was a prophecy for the first century Christian church and is a prophecy for the last century Christian church and to the world that will be affected by the things of Revelation. And how do I know? How do I know that this prophecy that we're reading right here is one more sequence that parallels what Jesus gave us in Matthew 24? It isn't just that the gospel is going to the whole world, as Jesus said, and it isn't just that there is going to be peace taken from the earth, that there will be the sword, famine, and pestilence as judgments upon the earth, warning judgments upon the earth, letting the earth know that the end is coming. It is the first wave of judgments that God sends upon the earth that is intended to wake up the earth as to the time in which they live. What is the very next event in, in verse 9? What did Jesus say? There will be a time of trouble such as never has been since the world has begun, nor even to be. He's talking about the great tribulation that is to come upon the earth. And what happens during that great tribulation? He said, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, now, Revelation has a lot to say about the abomination of desolation in more than one name, more than one title, more than one image. There's the beast, there's the there's the harlot, there's the there's Babylon, there's the you know there are various caricatures that are used to describe the same Antichrist. Come. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, Jesus said in Matthew 24, that it's time to flee to the mountains. It's particularly true for the Jews of that day. And those who fled, by the way, never experienced the destruction of Jerusalem. History shows us that they saw the armies of Rome circling the city of Jerusalem in AD 67 three and a half years before Jerusalem was destroyed in the temple, where not one inhabitant survived. There were a million people that died in the city of Jerusalem. Josephus tells us about this, a historian. But those who saw the army circling the city, circling Jerusalem in AD, the fall of AD 67, saw that this was the time that Jesus was talking about when the abomination of desolation, which was Rome, pagan Rome in those days, pagan Rome in the first century. And when Rome, the Roman soldiers left and went back to Rome because of a crisis that was happening in Rome, they thought, the Jews thought that they had chased them off, but they didn't. They just, that's called the Jewish war. That was the Jewish war. And they thought that they had chased off the Romans. They had not. There was another reason that the soldiers of Rome left 
and and discontinued their battle against Jerusalem and went back to Rome. But those who heard the words of Jesus said, when you see the, abom when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, then it's time, you know it's time to flee. And pray that your flight be not in the winter on the Sabbath, right? That's what it says in Matthew 24, but flee. For there will be such a time of trouble as has not been. And there was in Jerusalem, but worldwide there's going to be another one much greater. It's going to be the mother of great tribulations at the end of time. Jesus says, such as has never been, nor ever will be. And they left and they went. Some of them went to a little place called Pella. And they were spared. What came in AD 70 when Rome came back and destroyed the city and the temple, and not one stone was left upon another. Yes. So what happens in Revelation? So there are these judgments that come. Jesus said there will be sword, famine, and pestilence. And then he, then he talks about, in, in verses 15 and following, the great tribulation, what the people of God will go through, and the world, as we approach the coming of Christ. There will be people who will die for their faith. People who die for their faith. He says in verse 9, When I opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our body on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. And what happens next? I looked when he had opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. What does Jesus say in Matthew 24? I want to look at it again. Because I want you to see how much this parallels what Jesus has already told us. Immediately, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, which is represented in the fifth seal as God's people are persecuted and, and there are many who will die for their faith before Jesus comes. The gospel is going to the whole world and as the gospel goes to the whole world, it raises the ire of the enemy and persecution again is leveled upon people of God as it has been throughout the centuries, as it was in the Middle Ages when the Reformation was going on. And I'm going to say it again because not everybody has heard this. During the Reformation, during the time when the gospel was being clarified and brought up out of the dust that had been covering it because of the Roman church, covering up the gospel, 50 to 100 million Christians lost their lives during that time. What's John talking about here? Those who are slain for the word of God and the testimony, that's what comes after these judgments, after the sword, famine, or and pestilence. And what does Jesus say about these signs that are talked about in the heavens and under the sixth seal that we just read. Verse 29 of Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give us light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heavens will be shaken. You see the parallels here? Look at your handout. It's all there. You see the parallels between Matthew 24 and Revelation 6? It's all there. What comes next in Matthew 24, verse 30? Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming from the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with great sound of the trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four corners of the earth. What's happening here? Same thing that's happening in Revelation 6 and verse 14. 
and the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who will be able to stand? So, this is just a Bible study, right? It's just a Bible study. But it's a relevant Bible study because we see things happen in our world that give us a taste of what has been prophesied. We look out and we see this storm that is brewing, a perfect storm. There's no need to fear, for though the earth be removed and the mountains are cast into the sea, David says in Psalm 46, I will not fear, for the Lord is my refuge and strength. We have strength and safety in our Savior, but he has also given us the command to watch and be ready, he says, for the coming of the Son of Man and those things which accompany and precede his coming, the coming of the Son of Man will be at an hour you do not expect. As it was in the days of Noah. Do you, are you familiar with these verses? As it was in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. As it was. People were building and marrying and planting and living life like normal because they had been accustomed to. Accustomed to life as it is on the earth today. We are accustomed to it. We're, we're kind of deadened to the things that we see because because we're so used to it, it's kind of crept up to us. But do not sleep. So, it's my message. Time for us to wake up as a church. It's time for us to recognize and to understand these prophecies that tell us what's ahead. It is. I hope it's important to you. Father in heaven, this morning, as we have studied these things, I pray that you will place in our hearts the confidence that we are yours. What better way to protect us and to keep us safe in the care of our Savior than the gospel that makes us safe with him no matter what, because we are his, because he has worked to save us by his doing and his dying. On our behalf, we are safe with him. Yet, I pray too that this will not what things, what the things that are approaching, the things that are ahead, the things that are brewing in our world and our nation today will not catch us by surprise as it did the people of Pompeii. Lord, I pray that you will wake us, for the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Thank you for giving us your word and for helping us to understand as your spirit leads. In Jesus' name, amen.